Hello, this is Dr. Tarek Hanna with Emory University Radiology. And as part of the 22 Don't Miss Lesions in Radiology, we're going to be giving a cervical spine lecture here today, covering the basics of cervical spine injury. Now, cervical spine injury is an extremely complex topic, and this lecture will by no means be comprehensive. Uh, so we would recommend other readings, specifically the learning radiology segment is a good overview. Here we're going to be covering the high points of evaluation of the cervical spine, starting with mechanisms of cervical spine injury, looking at some of the more common fractures that you may encounter, and then introducing the topic of spinal instability. Finally, we'll be looking briefly at the thoracolumbar spine. We're going to start with looking at the anatomy of the cervical spine, then developing a basic approach to looking at cervical spine radiographs, and then talking about cervical spine stability. So this is a sagittal plane anatomic specimen, and there are seven cervical vertebral bodies. Now the C1 and C2 cervical vertebral bodies are relatively anatomically distinct from the remainder of the vertebral bodies. You can see we've labeled the anterior arch of the C1 vertebral body for you, as well as the C2 vertebral body. Now, in addition to the vertebral bodies, the bony structures in the cervical spine, we have a lot of ligaments, as well as the intervertebral discs that hold the cervical spine together. Now, anterior to the cervical vertebral bodies, outlined in blue, that's going to be the course of the anterior longitudinal ligament. And that holds the cervical vertebral bodies in place, and it's a relatively tough ligament, and prevents them from migrating forward. Now, along with the anterior longitudinal ligament, you have a posterior longitudinal ligament, and that's outlined in purple, and that runs along the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies. Now, there are other ligaments in the cervical spine. There are actually a lot of other ligaments, and with an arrow down there, we've just outlined some of the more posterior ligaments that connect the spinous processes to each other, and those are the interspinous ligaments. Now, this is another sagittal anatomic specimen, and when evaluating the cervical spine, we want to try and have a systematic approach. So what we're going to do is, first you want to look at the vertebral body alignment. And we're going to introduce three lines here. Look along the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies, along the course of the anterior longitudinal ligament, and you want to make sure that the cerv cervical vertebral bodies, the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies, are in a nice smooth arc. There's no step-offs. The vertebral bodies should flow continuously. Also, the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies, outlined in that middle black line, should also form a nice smooth arc. And then posterior to that, behind the actual spinal cord itself, at the junction of the spinous processes and the lamina of the cervical vertebral bodies, you have what's called the spinolaminar line. And these lines should all be roughly parallel to each other, and you should be able to trace them easily. Now, once you've determined that alignment in the cervical spine is intact, you want to look at the individual vertebral bodies themselves. And you can look from C3 through C7, and you want to make sure that the vertebral body heights are intact and the end plates are relatively straight without any deformities. And we've outlined now the C3 vertebral body in black, and you can see how it's relatively square. And finally, you want to look and make sure there are no obvious displaced fractures or fracture fragments that you can see anywhere in the cervical spine. So again, you want to look at the lines and make sure that the alignment of the cervical vertebral bodies is intact. Then you want to look at the vertebral body heights, make sure that there's no compression. And then thirdly, you want to look and make sure there's no uh, displaced fractures or fracture fragments. Here we have another sagittal anatomic specimen. And we're going to introduce the concept of stability in the cervical spine now. Now, for the purposes of this lecture, although this is an oversimplification, we're going to assume that anything in the high cervical spine involving the occipital condyles, C1 or C2, is an unstable fracture. Now, in the lower cervical spine, I'd like to introduce what we call the three-column method, where you can divide the cervical spine 
into three separate columns, and if only a single column is affected, you have a stable fracture. If two columns are affected, you have an unstable fracture. And there's an anterior column, a middle column, and a posterior column. Now, since it's extremely unusual to have a fracture involving the anterior column, skipping the middle column and involving the posterior column, for all purposes, a fracture that involves the middle column becomes an unstable fracture. And I'm going to elaborate a little bit further on that. Here in green we have the anterior column, and that involves the anterior longitudinal ligament and the anterior one-half of the vertebral bodies. Now we have the posterior column, also in green, and that involves everything posterior to the posterior longitudinal ligament. That includes the pedicles, that includes the lamina, and that includes the spinous processes and all the ligaments that attach them. Now removing those two columns, we have the middle column, and that involves the posterior half of the vertebral bodies as well as the posterior longitudinal ligament. And again, if two of these columns are affected, you have an unstable fracture, uh, while if only one column is affected, the fracture is stable. Now we're going to have some examples of cervical spine fractures. And what we're going to introduce our cervical spine fractures by mechanism of injury, and of course, Although we're going to talk about mechanisms of injury as relatively discrete occurrences, uh, many injuries to the cervical spine are complex. They may involve flexion and rotation, or flexion and extension, or extension and rotation, or a combination thereof. And we're just going to try to simplify them into their core elements here. So a hyperflexion injury is an injury in which you have compressive forces that act on the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. And you have distractive forces that act on the posterior aspects of the vertebral bodies. And you can see here, anteriorly, as the vertebral bodies are squeezing together with the compressive forces, that's where you're going to fracture. And then the facet joints are pulling apart, and the spinous processes are pulling apart even more, and that's where you're going to have the distractive forces causing ligamentous injury. Here we have a cone down radiograph, which is actually of the uh, upper lumbar spine, but it illustrates very nicely what a compression fracture looks like, and this is a typical hyperflexion injury. Look for a moment at the lower vertebral body. It's nice and square. The anterior vertebral body height is intact, and it's Anteriorly, the vertebral body is just as tall as it is posteriorly. The compressed vertebral body has been crushed anteriorly, affecting the anterior column, but actually the posterior aspect of the vertebral body, the height there is still preserved, so the middle and posterior columns are attacked. So this is a stable anterior compression fracture caused by hyperflexion. Now this is two dried bone specimens laterally. On the left we have a dried bone specimen showing a normal cervical verte vertebral body, and on the right you have a dried bone specimen showing a compressed vertebral body, and you can see that the anterior vertebral body height is diminished in the vertebral body on the right, uh, compatible with a compression fracture. Now another type of hyperflexion injury which is more severe is a flexion teardrop fracture. On the right we have three on the sorry, on the left you have three consecutive vertebral bodies and they're normal and you can see the alignment is preserved and the vertebral bodies are intact. And on the right you have three vertebral bodies and the middle vertebral body you can see is fractured in the middle as well as compressed anteriorly as a result of a hyperflexion injury. And then the compressive forces are acting anteriorly and the distractive forces are acting posteriorly and you can see that the facet joints have pulled apart and the spinous processes have pulled apart and that would be likely to cause ligamentous injury. Here on the left we have a lateral radiograph of the cervical spine and the C2 vertebral body just to orient yourself is normal and intact and then below that you have a C3 vertebral body which is severely fractured and you can see that actually the anterior aspect of the C3 vertebral body has been displaced anteriorly and there's actually uh, 
a focal angular deformity, and we call that a kyphotic deformity in the cervical spine at this level. And on the right, we've illustrated for you again with dried bone specimens, the fracture through that mid C3 vertebral body with distraction of the posterior elements. Again, this is a severe fracture known as a flexion teardrop fracture. Now, another type of common hyperflexion injury within the cervical spine is known as the bilateral facet dislocation. And the facets are relatively difficult for beginners who are looking at the cervical spine radiographs to isolate. And so, in the lateral radiograph of the cervical spine, you see on the left, we've isolated with blue and purple dots a normal facet joint, and that's the C3, C4 facet joint. And just to go over some basic terminology, at C3, with the blue dots, we call that the inferior articulating facet. And that articulates with the superior articulating facet of C4 outlined in the purple dots. And you can see how those lie on top of each other like shingles on a roof. Now, if we were looking at this cervical spine radiograph, we would first have looked at alignment. And if you scan down, you notice that the C5 and C6 vertebral bodies are no longer aligned. You can see the anterior aspect of the C5 vertebral body is significantly anteriorly displaced with respect to the C6 vertebral body. And when you look back at the posterior elements, you can see there's something wrong with the facet joints. Now, on the right, we also have dried bone specimens, and we've illustrated a normal facet joint on the top. You can see how those facet joints line up, and then on the bottom we've illustrated the bilateral facet dislocation where the superior facet has actually slid over and fallen off, if you will, the more inferior facet, and that's what we have here, and that's why those facets no longer align. This is again a bilateral facet dislocation, which is a severe hyperflexion type injury. Here we have another example of a bilateral facet dislocation. You'll notice that these vertebral bodies don't look quite as clean as the other ones, and this is a much older individual who has significant degenerative changes in their cervical spine, and you can see large anterior and posterior osteophytes. Now, at C5, C6, you can see on the left image marked anterior displacement of the C5 vertebral body with respect to the C6 vertebral body, and then we've zoomed up for you, and you can see that the facet joints are dislocated at the C5, C6 level, and just to better illustrate normal, we've showed above that at the C4, C5 facets the normal articulation and how that should look like. Again, the important thing is that you see that there's something wrong because the alignment is not maintained, and then you can interrogate more closely the facet joints and you'll see that they're dislocated bilaterally. Now here we have a CAT scan from a much younger patient with a similar injury. And the middle image is a midline sagittal CT image. And if you scan down the anterior vertebral body line, what you notice that there's marked anterior displacement of the C6 with respect to C7 vertebral body at the anterior cortex and the posterior cortex. So we would imagine that both the anterior longitudinal and the posterior longitudinal ligaments are disrupted. And then posteriorly you see that there's distraction of those posterior elements at this level on the midline sagittal image. Now as we look both to the left and the right, you can see normal facet joints indicated by the arrows and how they line up like shingles on a roof. And then when you go down to the level in question, at C6, C7, you can see that we have facet dislocations on both the right and left side and those are indicated by the red dots. Now moving on to hyperextension type injuries, this is exactly what you'd imagine. Here we're going to have distractive forces acting on the anterior cervical spine and compressive forces acting on the posterior aspect of the cervical spine. And so you'd expect to have ligamentous injury, such as injury to the anterior longitudinal ligament because of the pulling apart that you have anteriorly. And then you'd expect to have fractures posteriorly because of the compressive forces that are going to be acting on the posterior elements, including the facet joints and the spinous processes.
Now, here we also have dried bone specimens, which illustrate what a hyperflexion injury might look like. And again, on the right, you see how we have distraction of the anterior vertebral bodies and compression of the posterior elements at that level, and how we have a fracture that runs through the facets of the more inferior vertebral bodies at this level. Now, a specific type of hyperextensive hyperextension injury is a hangman's fracture. Here we have dried bone specimens. On the left, a normal of the C2 vertebral body. And again, we're looking at it from the side. Just to orient you, you can see the dens anteriorly. You can see that smooth surface, and that's where C1 would articulate. And that hole you're looking at is where the vertebral artery would actually run through. And on the right, you have an illustration of what a hangman's fracture would look like. Now we're going to show that in another projection. Here we're looking from the top down on the C2 vertebral body. Again, normal is on the left and the fracture is on the right. And you can see the fractures would run straight across the pedicles of this C2 vertebral body. And again, in this hyperextensive hyperextension type injury, you have distraction of the anterior aspect of the vertebral bodies and compression of the posterior aspect resulting in a fracture. And that's exactly what's happened here. So here we have a lateral radiograph of the upper cervical spine. And this is a hangman's fracture. You can look at the, again, scanning for alignment, the anterior longitudinal ligament, or the anterior vertebral body line, is abnormal. You look at the C2 vertebral body, is markedly anterior dis anteriorly displaced with respect to the C3 vertebral body, likely indicating a tear of the anterior longitudinal ligament. And also the posterior vertebral body cortexes don't line up. And so the C2 posterior vertebral body cortex is displaced anteriorly with respect to the C3 vertebral body cortex. And yet the posterior elements, the spinal laminar line, is relatively intact. And when you look in between those, you can see outlined by the red dots a fracture of the pedicles of C2 at that level. And here we have a CT of a similar injury. And uh, on the left, you see the sagittal CT image, and we've indicated the hangman's fracture for you on one side. And then we have an axial CT image on the right, and you can see the fractures through the bilateral pedicles of C2. And you can see on this image how if you fractured through those locations, you can imagine now how the anterior aspect of that C2 vertebral body would be able to slide forward while leaving the posterior aspect of the vertebral body in place. Now, another type of, another mechanism of injury in the cervical spine is the axial loading injury. And that's when instead of having compressive forces, you have compressive forces that actually impact the entirety of the vertebral body, as illustrated here. And what that does is instead of having compressive and distractive forces, where you fracture a portion and then you tear ligaments in another portion of the vertebral body, here you can imagine you would squish the entirety of the vertebral body itself. Here on the left, we have normal dried bone specimens, a lateral view and a superior or axial view on the bottom. And on the right, you can see that the entirety of that cervical vertebral body is compressed. And on that bottom right superior image, you can see all those fracture lines that go through the vertebral body. And that posterior bony fragment, and this is relatively typical of burst type fractures, has actually been pushed back into the spinal canal. And that's important, of course, because the spinal cord lives there and could be compressed by what we call retropulsed or posteriorly displaced osseous fragments. Here we have an axial CT image of a burst type fracture and you can see those black lines are the lucencies that represent the fractures of the vertebral body. You can see how they involve both the anterior and middle column and how you have displaced bony fragments that are going posteriorly into the spinal canal and probably impacting the spinal cord at this level. Now the upper cervical spine is relatively complex anatomically. And I'd just like to introduce another type of axial loading fracture, which is a type of a burst injury.
you can imagine if you have a compressive force load to the top of the head, it's going to transmit through the occipital condyles, and you can see we've labeled an occipital condyle with the green arrow on the right anatomic specimen, and this is a coronal anatomic specimen. And then we've labeled the lateral mass of C1 below that, and then the main C2 vertebral body. And in green dots, we've outlined the actual articulation between the occipital condyle and C1. Now, the force as it goes through the head will actually transmit through the occipital condyles, and you can imagine how the lateral masses of C1 are going to be crushed in between the occipital condyles and C2. And because of their shape, their relatively wedge shape, they can actually be squeezed outward. And that's going to be important in the radiographic evaluation of the upper cervical spine. Now the fracture we're discussing here is actually the Jefferson fracture. And the atlas is of course just another name for the C1 vertebral body. And on the left you have a normal dried bone specimen of the atlas. And on the right we've illustrated for you what a Jefferson fracture would look like. And the C1 vertebral body is the perfect example of what a bony ring is. And when you think of a bony ring, think about it like a pretzel. It's relatively hard to break a pretzel in only one location. And so when you have a fracture of a bony ring, one fracture, you should look because there's most often at least one other fracture, and there may be multiples. Now, on the left, we have the normal articulation between C1 and C2, and this is seen from anteriorly looking back. And you can see how the C1 lateral masses sit on the C2 vertebral body, and they're perfectly aligned. And now, in the setting of a Jefferson fracture, because the bony ring is no longer preserved, those lateral masses can slide sideways off of the C2 vertebral body. And what that does is it not only gives you extra space around the dens, it also displaces the C1 lateral masses off the C2 vertebral body, and you can see how they're no longer appropriately aligned. And here on the left we have what we call an open mouth odontoid view, which is the radiographic view we use to look at the alignment between C1 and C2. And we've illustrated for you with a green arrow the lateral mass of C1, and with a purple arrow where the C2 vertebral body terminates. And you can look at the other side and that's unlabeled and see if you can find these locations yourself. And that malalignment does indicate a fracture, and so this patient then goes to CT scan, and you can actually see a fracture there of the anterior arch of C1, and there were actually two fractures in that location. We're only showing you one of them. Now, as we said before, mechanisms of cervical spine injury are relatively complex, and a lot of these mechanisms are so multifactorial that they're actually, for our purposes, unknown mechanisms. And we're going to talk briefly about one specific type here, and that's the odontoid fracture. Now, the odontoid is the dens, which is part of the C2 vertebral body. And you can see in the upper left-hand corner the normal C2 vertebral body. And then we have three types of odontoid fractures. In the lower left, you have the type 1 odontoid fracture, which involves the tip of the dens, the very top of it, and then the type 2 fracture in the upper right hand corner is a fracture through the base of the dens, and then the lower right hand corner you have a fracture that actually involves the C2 vertebral body itself. Now some experts don't think that the type 1 fracture actually exists and divide it into superior and inferior odontoid fractures. Now for our purposes this is important because the blood supply to the dens is mainly contained within the vertebral body itself. And so you can imagine that a type 1 fracture or a type 2 fracture would have a more difficult time with healing than would a type 3 fracture. And also, the type 2 fracture doesn't have as much purchase within the C2 vertebral body itself. And so you could imagine how it would slide around a little bit more, whereas the type 3 fracture, because it involves a larger chunk of the vertebral body, would be relatively more stable. Now, 
These are often difficult to pick up on plain radiographs. On the left, we have a radiograph of a child. You can see the vertebral bodies are relatively rounded because they haven't completely ossified yet. And when you look at the C2 vertebral body, you can see that there's disruption of that anterior cortex and the dens is actually angulated forward and that's a type 2 fracture where the fracture has gone through the base of the odontoid process but does not actually involve the C2 vertebral body itself. And then in the right image you have an adult and you can see how there's a thin lucency, again a little bit difficult to appreciate on this lateral radiograph of the cervical spine, but the fracture goes down into the C2 vertebral body itself. And so that's compatible with a type 3 odontoid fracture. Now just briefly, the thoracolumbar spine. When a patient has a single fracture of the spine, you want to look carefully for other fractures of the spine because fractures can often be transmitted down the bony spinal column. And here on the left, we have a lateral radiograph of the thoracolumbar spine. And I think it's relatively easy to see the L5 fracture that we've labeled there. Look closely, the L4 vertebral body is normal, it has preserved height, and the L5 is much shorter. This is a diffuse burst type compression fracture. And you can see that the posterior vertebral body cortex is likely involved on the radiograph. But it's important to look up also and look at the L1 vertebral body, and you can see that it is less severely involved, but is definitely shorter than the L2 vertebral body, and so is also fractured. And we have on the right axial CT images of both of the L1 and L5 vertebral bodies, and you can see those multiple fractures that involve the vertebral bodies and how they involve the posterior vertebral body cortex, and you have those bony fragments which have been pushed posteriorly into the spinal canal. So these are two burst-type fractures uh, at L1 and L5. And that is the end of the cervical spine lecture.